And the reason is to learn, to seek knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then as you get older with that knowledge, you turn it into wisdom. Yeah, you do. And our job is, no matter what we did or who we were or whatever, is to give back that wisdom in order to preserve the integrity of the human race. Welcome everybody to the big show today. Our guest is the infamous El Americano. Many of you might have seen his life portrayed in the movie Blow. He's a major figure from the 1970s as he ran one of the biggest cocaine operations during its time. As a serial entrepreneur, he was part of the Medellin cartel, which was responsible for up to 85% of the cocaine smuggled into the United States. Our guest was released from prison in 2014 after serving nearly 20 years for drug smuggling. On December 2016, he was arrested again while giving a speech in San Diego for violating his parole. Then finally, in July of 2017, he was released for completing his parole violation. Let's all welcome Boston George Jung. Yes. <laughs> welcome, George. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to have you here on the show. Glad to be on board your ship. Wow. So, you know, this is a show where we basically we want to talk to our 24-year-old self. So my question to you is, what's like, what did you, what the number one thing that you took away from running an illegal operation that you can apply or learn or explain to these young men out there and women? Well... You know, it comes down to the great Bob Dylan who said, when you live outside the law, you must be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we're under the auspices of right now of a, a government that's so corrupt and rotten and, and to the core it takes money from pharmaceutical firms mm -hmm. that, that put promote opioids all over the goddamn country and mm -hmm. and string out everybody you know and and marijuana was actually legal forever yeah. until a guy named William Randolph Hearst yeah. came on board who owned all the yeah. all the rights to all the newspapers in the, in the United States and and, and DuPont right they worked together. Uh, right and the two of them decided that they wanted to keep cutting down the giant redwoods and yep. making cardboard boxes and newspapers and what have you and paper bags mm -hmm. when they had to make marijuana illegal. Do you know that Jamestown the first, in uh, Pennsylvania, okay, okay the yeah. first colonies, it was illegal not to grow, not to grow marijuana. Correct. Because it's... You know, they made sales for the, so, for the ships and the rope and what have you and whatever. So you're, you're a cannabis advocate. So you started in cannabis when you were smuggling operation, right? Right. I wasn't. Listen, I grew up in, in a town in Weymouth, Massachusetts and it, mm -hmm. in the 50s, and it was like happy days. Mm -hmm. There were no guns, no violence, no drugs. Wow. And and I didn't have any criminal intent at all. And And... And then I eventually, after numerous colleges and whatever, yeah, migrated out to California. Mm. And I Seems saw a lot of folks come to California these days. The West is the best and the yeah. East is a beast. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and the weather's nice around here. Right, but it takes a lot of money to live in California. It does. Unless you want to stand on the car with a sign, but that's okay. Mm. And I was after money. Sure. I, I mean, and I saw the, you know, first time I went to Beverly Hills, it was like the most amazing thing I ever saw in my How old entire life. I was like 25 years old. 25 years old? You yeah. had a stack of cash? No, I Beverly didn't have oh. any money. You, okay, so you just came out to Beverly Hills? Yeah. Wow. 
I mean, I didn't co- live there. I lived in, in Manhattan Beach in Long Beach, California, mm-hmm. and worked numerous jobs and what have you. And it's okay, so you're and, selling weed here in California? Yeah, I started out Absolutely. selling weed, and I saw that there was a profit in it. When, yep. And during that time, if, if you graduated from college, you, you started out $10,000 a year, $200 mm-hmm. a week. If you were a blue-collar guy, you made $100 a week. What year is this? This is back in, in 64, okay. 65. And, mm-hmm. I, and I knew that $10,000 a year wasn't going to cut it for me out right. here. Because I loved women, wine, and song. And, yeah. and money begets women. And that's the way it is. Um, <laughs> okay, you know, you got to make love to them, and they you know, let them shop till they drop, and they may not like what I'm saying, but that's the goddamn truth. So here you are, you have no money, you see the play that's going on in Beverly Hills, you go, I want to be part of that, right? Is that right. what happened? So oh, how did you make that happen? I wanted the Porsche, I wanted the Ferrari. Yeah, right, yeah, you want to be like, yeah, sure. How did I make it happen? This, I saw a pot and a profit in it, and... Yeah. and I was just Tell me about your first pot deal you ever made. Selling an ounce of pot. Really? <laughs> was it a two was it a two li- like was it a three finger or four finger bag? It was, it was a, a lid. Two finger. Yeah, yeah. lid. The lid. Yeah. And you know why they call them lids? No. Because the lid of a, a mason jar, mm-hmm. okay? And that oh. was the lid. That's how it became. And finally uh, someone decided to weigh it. Yeah. And got smarter. Yeah. Well, they got a lot smarter. Yep. But it was full of seeds and sticks and oh, what yeah. have you. Yep. I mean what they have today is like. Where, where'd you get it from? Like, like, did you buy it, a local guy at first, and then you yeah, it was, a, that? it was a local guy. So you know, I mean, there's always the local guy. So what did you do? Cut out the middleman. Cut out the middleman. Cut out the middleman. All the way up. Like, well, how did you? How did you ascend the ladder? Because okay. this is, yeah. I was living with an airline stewardess. All right. In fact, three of them. And oh, wow. In Manhattan Beach, and without money, and there's always a woman to blame. Yeah. And she saw my efforts, and and she said. I know somebody who can get you all the pot you want, George. And I said, take me. <laughs> and she took me to a barber shop in Manhattan Beach. Wow. And there was this kid from Connecticut, okay? And he owned the barber shop. It was called a tonsorial hair parlor. And I told him my situation, and he said, I can give you all the pot you want. And I said, great. And... I didn't really know what the hell to do with all the pot I wanted until my friend Frank, who was my boyhood buddy yeah. for life, and he was studying management, restaurant, restaurant management, okay. okay? And he was at that Mark Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco for, you know, summer course training. Mm-hmm. And he, before he left to go back to University of Massachusetts, he stopped at my house in Manhattan Beach. Oh. And I had a, a giant fishbowl full of pot, okay? And everybody rolled around giants or whatever. Yeah. It was just casual. And he said, where'd you get that? And I said, right down the street. And he said, how much did you pay? And I said, like $70. And he said, it's 300 back in Massachusetts. Ooh. And suddenly the lights went on. Now that's a big distance between California and Massachusetts. Like, so how, you got to set up a, a route. How, like, how did, like, when did you figure out? We you didn't needed? know what route. There were two routes. There was I-10 across Texas, yeah. and nobody wants to go across Texas because they hang you there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we, so we took the northern route. Okay. Okay. And, and I conceived the idea, like, motorhomes. Mm-hmm. Winnebago's, and we'll just lease them, and we'll, yeah. and we'll build secret compartments, and we'll have you, and we'll drive the pot back across country to you, yes. And, and the cops weren't really looking for weed then, were There they? were no cops. There was no DEA until really? 1974. Damn. Cops were just, you know, old guys with old fat guys who, you know, who didn't care what the hell was going on, yeah. just weren't really going to drink beer at the bar and go home. Yeah. Was it the first time you went in a Winnebago, though? What was the first time? 65, all right? And it took 
a ton across, okay? And holy moly. Well, I mean, I mean, it was no holy moly. Well, what did they do? They, did you get the money for it? The, the guy just right. fronts you a ton of weed and it's like, go. Yeah, because it was weed. Oh, I mean, really? this yeah, unlimited easy. weed. He fronted it or did you have them? He fronted it. Yeah. How much was 2000 so yeah, Listen, the whole drug business is done on the front. All right? Okay. And everything's done on the front. Nobody pays cash up front. Listen, when I sold my okay? weed, I got paid up front. Like, I gave you the weed, you give me the money. Well, yeah. you were pretty goddamn smart. <laughs> <laughs> How much is it worth, that 2,000 pounds? How much was it worth then? Yeah. Oh, well, $300, $300 a kilo, okay? Mm -hmm. two, two pounds, okay? So $120,000. And, and like, I would just give it to these guys because yeah. I grew up with them. That's different. We were boyhood friends. So, you know, you know, they say that the cocaine business is done with a gun and the marijuana business is done with a handshake. So here you are, you're doing weed, and now all of a sudden one day you say, hey, I can sell blow. But I didn't say that. What happened? The government, what was the transition? The government arrested me. Oh, for weed? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And gave me five years and at that time, there was no mandatory sentencing, so you did 20 months. Oh. And they sent me to a place called Danbury, Connecticut, okay? Right. And in fact, I was in there with yeah. Gordon Liddy, the Watergate, oh, wow. and all that and everything, okay? Was he, was he, what kind of guy was Gordon Liddy? Was he crazy? He's an asshole. Really? Yeah. Oh, How did you get busted, though? Like, what right. happened? Yeah. I, I was in Chicago oh. with a load of pot, and I was sitting at the Playboy Club, Okay, oh. try to pick up this beautiful Scandinavian luscious treat. Yeah. And <laughs> I get a tap on the shoulder. And I turn around, it was two guys in suits. And like, yeah. I didn't know anybody in suits. Yeah. And I came and they said, uh, would you step out into the lobby? George would like to talk to you for a minute. Yeah. And I figured, I don't think they were yeah. shoe salesmen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they said to you, your friend, David Listener, got busted mm. for heroin, and he decided to trade you in for the marijuana. And this is a, actually a true story. And they said, we don't even care about marijuana, but we have to arrest you. And they said, we're going to take you to a bad place, Cook County Jail. Oh, yeah. County well, County. I didn't know what a bad place was, okay? This is the 60s or 70s now? The 60s. Oh, because they really didn't want yeah. a white kid to go to Cook County Jail. I mean, yeah. you had the Blackstone Rangers, the Crips, and the Bloods. <laughs> like, I don't mind saying this. I'm Boston George, for Christ's sake, but I was terrified. Sure. Oh. You know, like, what the hell am I doing here? And so I figured there's only one thing to do. As to freak out. And I threw a metal chair across the room and I said, you guys want to get it on? And I said, Just peacocking? I said, and I said to myself, I hope they don't want to get it on. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this big tough old black man, he came up and he said, leave him alone. He had the balls to do that. And he said, nobody touches him. Wow. And then I went to court and the judge gave me five years. Mm -hmm. And on five years, then thing you did one third and you got parole, okay? Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, they gave me as a cellmate a guy named Carl Slater mm -hmm. from Columbia. Mm -hmm. And when you go into a cell, you talk, mm -hmm. what are you doing here? Da, 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 da. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and, for. and I said, I'm here for flying marijuana across the United States, the border into the United States. And he said, do you know anything about cocaine? And I said, <laughs> should I? I? <laughs> I said, no. no. And he said, I said, he said, let me tell you something. He said, it costs $60,000 a kilo in the United States. Bro. And all of a sudden, the top of my head blew off. So I wasn't miserable any longer being in there. Yeah. And some of my dad came and he cried in the visiting room or whatever, but I was planning the whole thing with him. Yeah. We were 
planning routes, how to get it in, and yeah. this and that, and whatever. People have no idea that there are no police in the sky. All right? And smuggling in air, with airplanes is probably the easiest thing on the planet. And they, people don't even understand well, that. You know, okay, you're right. The borders are porous like crazy. And if you want to get across, you're going to get across. Right. So it's, it's yeah. ludicrous. It's ridiculous. And they won't scramble fighter jets unless a, a plane's moving at, at you know, fast speed. super speed and doesn't acknowledge, okay, the towers or whatever. Carlos took me down there to see this guy yeah. called Pablo Escobar. Oh. He asked me what I could do, and I said, this is what I can do. I can get this shit across the border into the United States. Yeah. And then he said, well, after you get it there, what can you do? And yeah. I lied. I said, I can sell it, too. Ooh. And I said, here's the deal. Here's what I said, I want 10000 a kilo for transporting it into the United States. Ooh. And I said, then I want 40% of every kilo I sell for you. Oh. And he said, okay. And so All right. we were ready to go. And the first load we brought in... Mm -hmm. I took it to a guy, the barber, mm -hmm. the nice barber, the barber, my the air stu stewardess. stewardess helped me with, okay? Yep. And I said, sell it. And he said, I don't know, Jesus Christ. He said, you know, all of a sudden you disappear for a couple of years and you show up now and you got all this goddamn cocaine. He yep. said, I don't know if I can sell I said, I said, please, Richard, go sell it. Yeah. And How much was it? He tested it, okay? It was 150 kilos, all right? <laughs> and, uh, and it burned at 187, yeah, which is pure. Ooh. People don't even know what that is anymore. Pure cocaine. What's man. pure cocaine like? Tell me about it. Like when you do it. What is, how is it different from the, you the, know the stuff that's on the you street You know what it's now? like? It's better than 55 naked blondes kissing them all at the same time. Really? Yeah, oh. okay. I don't give a shit what anybody yeah. says. It's a magnificent goddamn drug. So like, you had no competition. You're there, and everybody's in love with this new drug called cocaine. Everybody that had a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, I was invited to every fucking party in Beverly Hills. Jeez, I bet you I were. I mean, nonstop around the clock. Yeah. I mean, I had all the fucking, you know, Richard Pryor, you know, Jane Fonda, fucking, I mean, yeah. even a governor, jury, okay? And, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was insane. Things grew, yeah. you know, the, I call them the gods of chaos. They kept bestowing these pilots upon me and this and that who worked for Pan Am. And, 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 you know what yeah. I found about pilots is? They'll tell on you in a minute. Well, okay, besides <laughs> that, is they're, all, they're all inherent risk takers because they fly. Right. And I, I've approached pilots before, and I'm shockingly most all say yes because of this 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 gene or something that they have. They're thrill junkies. Yeah. But they're a pain in the ass, too. So did you make a lot of them wealthy? But, but Pablo lot, made, yeah. made a rule. You know, he said, when you hire these guys, he said, I want to know where they live mm -hmm. and where their children go to school and this and that. So how did that make and you like, feel? How did, like, and, do I hear you guys me, saying, well, it made me feel like shit. Okay, because you know what? But did it make you feel I would open yeah. up the, the, the aluminum camera case with a million dollars in it, hundred dollar bills. Mm -hmm. And I said, you can have this, but you've got to give up where your wife lives and your children and everything else. And what happened? And they would say, okay. Every time. Yeah, and it wouldn't yeah. make me sick. But I was sick too. And so we kept playing the game. And the game went on. And the game became more and more violent and crazy. I mean, and Pablo became. So what happens is incrementally you get sucked down the rabbit hole. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no yellow brick road. So did you ever think while you're doing this how much money is enough? Like, like, or I'm going to pull up a question of that is, is like you have so much and, it, and it's like, I just want to fucking stop right now and take what I have and take it off the table and go home. But you can't. I'll tell, Why? You, I'll tell you something. That the, when I first started all this, mm -hmm. my whole uh, 
agenda was to make a million dollars, which to me was a fortune in the yeah. 60s, okay? It's a huge money. I mean, my father grew up in the Depression, mm -hmm. and I asked him for a quarter. It was mm -hmm. like, how about a nickel, kid? Mm. You know, like, I mean, and all of a sudden I had a million dollars. That's a did million you, did dollars. Did you ever go to your father and hand him some cash? That's a funny story because I, did my I gave him like ten million. We opened up a, a box in the Rockland Trust in, in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I said it's, it's okay, Dad. You can come to this bank. You can go to the box. Mm -hmm. We're partners, and you can take what you want. No, oh. and how did that go? And one day I went back to the box, and there was only like I don't know a hundred thousand in there. With a note, not even that, and. It was, I, and I went back, I said, what did you do with the money? And he said, I paid off a lot of mortgages for people that needed it. Oh, man. And I said, are you, are you shitting me? He said, what do you care? He said, it's all illegal anyway, and who cares about it? He said, you can go get more. Oh, my God. And I said, well, I said, I'm going to put you on a budget, Dad. There you go. <laughs> did that work out? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> what would you do with all the cash? Like how cash. do you? How do Money you know? is a pain in the ass. Weighs a lot too. You know that, it? don't you? Weighs a lot. People would be surprised yeah, how cash a weighs. Pain, it's a and counting it. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass too. It's insane. And pretty soon we got to the point like, who is snorting coke when we were counting? And we had girls helping us count it, and everybody in the fucking the neighborhood. Girls in bikinis yeah. doing blow and counting. Naked. Naked. We don't want yeah. bikinis on them. Why? Because they could hide it. And steal it? Yeah, stealing money and stuff. Yeah. When the cops busted me, they, like a hundred of them all came in, whatever, put us on the ground, busted us. And they took all my assets that I had except for one thing, advanced nutrients. And they, if they would have cleaned that warehouse out that day, I'd have been out of business. But they left it open. And from, from virtually, I was a million dollars in debt. But I was lucky. I had some inventory in there and uh, was able to make it work. So there's, I was down all the way and I came up. Yeah. Scrap my ass off. You didn't have cash buried anywhere? No. No? Ask him if he how much cash he has buried. Most people don't. <laughs> okay, you but know. George, my question is how do you wash the money and make it legit, put it in bank in accounts? In those days, it was a lot easier. Because they didn't have the $10,000 limit? Correct. Oh, they came up with that limit because of George? Probably. So I'll tell you what. It got to be such a problem that they started... Using banks in Miami, okay, and yep. buying off bank presidents and shit. Oh, there were a lot of them. And I said, this is stupid. I said, if the guy gets caught, a bank president, we're all going to federal prison in New York second. Yep. I said, if we could fly the shit out of there, why can't we fly the money where we want? Yeah. I said, and. So where are you going to take it, to Europe? Oh, the best place, the smartest people on the planet. Is in Europe? Switzerland. Oh, you would have gotten to Switzerland. Everybody. How would you have got your money there? Did you think it out? Did you think it through? Yeah, I thought it through. Oh. It's easy. Mm. Fly it, boat. Layer jets. Layer jets, cargo, maybe. Yeah, yeah whatever it. you want. And they pick you up at the airport in a limo. They're happy to see <laughs> you. Know? And you may meet the President of the United States or whatever, or some other criminal son of a bitch or whatever. Everybody's lined up for blocks trying to give them my money. And you know. Okay, I, so here you are. You're selling all this stuff in here in LA. Now, how you're going through 150 kilos as fast as you can go. Well, like, what are, what are your volumes? Like, is it a ton a week you're going through here? Became, like, how much? It became, I don't know. It became a couple of tons a week. Okay. Holy shit. So, what's the most cash you ever had in one place? I saw in the movie, like, there's you had rooms full of it. It was like a pain in the ass. We well, used well. to weigh it, okay? Yeah. A bill weighs a, a gram. A, a million dollars in hundred dollar bills yeah. weighs 20.2 pounds, okay? Mm. Okay. And. 10 million weighs 200 pounds. And, okay, and 100 million weighs a ton. Wow. And, you know, when you start getting like two or three tons, yeah. you got money up the ass. So what does like, that feel like? Like, okay, you walk in this house and you got three tons of cash, $100 bills, most of them probably. It feels insane. Well, what like like do you feel powerful? Do you feel like you can, no, you you can buy like anything, anyone? I mean a, what? All of a sudden it's become a job. Oh. Interesting. All right. You know, smuggling is an adventure. Yeah. You know, counting money is a job. Mm. It's a pain in the ass.
All of it's a pain in the ass. And I was in it, to be honest with you, I, I was a thrill junkie. I was in it for the trip. So back to the question, was there ever a time where you thought, I just want to take my money off the table and that's enough it's, I don't, to quit? Not when things got heady, but before that, you said, I, like, like I, you know what, the judge, you're in. the judge told me, and he was an Irishman, mm -hmm. I'm ashamed of that, but he he, he, said, he had to give, sentence me under the mandatory drug laws. Yep. And he said, I want to ask you something. He said, you were 31 years old and you had 100 million of your own. Mm -hmm. He said, which is like a billion today. Mm -hmm. And he said, why didn't you just take it and go away? He said, I've thought about this for a long time. Yeah. And I had an answer. It took me a while to figure out the answer. Yeah. I was a thrill junkie. Mm. It wasn't even about the money. The money was just a tool. What gave you the biggest thrill? Smuggling. Actual flying? Yeah, actual flying. It does, doesn't it? Beating yeah. the man. Yeah. Okay? Beating people at the game. Okay, it was better. I used, Did I, you feel like you're of society but not part of society? What is society? Well, but the a, people around us. People are turned into drones, you know? Mm. 20 years of school and they put you on the day shift. Bob Dylan said that. He said a lot of things that I loved, okay? Mm -hmm. And what the hell is the day shift? 40 years of nine to five on the LA freeway, okay? It's like your whole goddamn life and sitting in a, a, a cubicle somewhere. And but how does that compare to going to jail? I'd rather be in a cubicle than in jail. I don't know. It's all relative. No. You know, so and you like, get, you don't plan on. How go long does it take you to get habituated, habituated in jail where you, you go, okay, I, I, I can't, you know, either one's good? It's, it's all relative. Right. Okay. Yeah. And like, you know, life is a gamble and luck is an art form. All right. And to tell you the God's honest truth, I would never trade my life for anything on this planet, okay? Mm -hmm. I did it, and I enjoyed it, and I had a hell of a good time. What's your best memory? All right. This, you know what? Probably the first time I ever took a cheerleader to Weymouth Great Hill, <laughs> which, okay, after the football game, yeah. that was my great memory. Well, that's a good one. All right. And like, that was great. But the other, all of it just, it's just a combination of, I live my life like a tornado. What'd you learn about life from all that tornado? What did I learn? Yeah. Don't get caught. Okay. <laughs> What'd you learn about women? You know what? Not a goddamn thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. yeah. All right. And my father and my mother used to be yelling at him, and he used to sit there with the newspaper and a cigar. And when I got old enough that I thought I could ask him a question, yep. I said, why don't you take that shit down? And he put the paper down, and he just looked at me like, he said, someday you'll know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, how did your relationship with Pablo yeah. Escobar change from the first time you met him to the last time you talked to him? Because it became a very complex, crazy business. <laughs> and, <laughs> and like, I'm not a violent guy. And I don't even like guns. And don't try to rob me when I leave this show, goddammit, because I'm not holding. <laughs> but... There became a, a madness, a violence about him, okay? Blowing up commercial airliner, killing all these people and this and that. Yep. Like, it no longer became a business. It became an evil force of insanity. Yeah. And like... So at what point did you realize you're around these type of people and it's insanity and they have no bottom? It came to a point, like, after three or four years and going down there and listening... Sitting at that table, at that okay, at, at his at his place down there in Medellin, mm -hmm. like, and and he said, 
We're gonna shoot down a commercial airliner. No shit. Are oh, we gonna we're gonna take over the Hall of Justice in Bogota <laughs> and kill all the fucking people in there? Okay, so and you're, burn you're, the you're, buildings in the ground. Jesus Christ! You're sitting there and you're hearing this, and you know you got this psychopath sitting across wanting to do all this stuff. What are you? What's going through your head? It's like get me the fuck out of here, or like get like, me to, get me the fuck out of so here. So at that point, you probably want to take all your money off the table and never right. see him again, right? And I'll tell you a story, and it's a true story, and. It got to a point where all the money and everything I had, I drove a, it was in the winter in Cape Cod in Massachusetts, okay? Mm -hmm. I had a beautiful house, I had everything. And I drove down a side road to a deserted beach and the wind was blowing, the white caps coming off the water. And I had a 357 Magnum on the seat. Mm -hmm. And we thought about it. Yeah. 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 That's just that, you know what? The universe is infinite and infinity has a being. And that yes, being, does. that being is the essence of the soul. Yes, it is. And, which is God. Hmm. Or a higher spiritual power. Well, whatever. That's what I learned. You know? In 76 years, okay? So, I'm going to ask you a question. Don't cry, Mike. God no. damn it, you're big, Mike. <laughs> you you said if you had to do it all over again, you wouldn't trade anything. I don't think that's 100% accurate. Because you can't the, take back... The whole experience? Yeah, and we're here for a reason. And the reason is to learn, to seek knowledge, mm -hmm. and... And then, as you get older, with that knowledge, you turn it into wisdom. Yeah, you do. And our job is, no matter what we did or who we were or whatever, is to give back that wisdom in order to preserve the integrity of the human race. Yeah. And I honestly, I'm not bullshitting you, and I believe that, and I know that. I believe you believe it. Okay. I think we're gonna be friends, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. How many people did you have working for you at the height of all this madness? There weren't many. I mean, I had like four or five pilots. Uh, yep. And good fucking pilots. Did right? you find that you made them rich and they all quit on you? You know what? One day this pilot, he was a, a captain from Pan Am. He yep. flew fucking fighter jets in Vietnam and everything. Mm -hmm. And he called me, he said, I want to see you. And I went to the restaurant where we yep. used to meet everything. It was in Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. And he said, I quit. And I said, why? Yeah. And I said, you want more money? And he says, George, you made me rich. I got what I want. Yeah. And he said, I'm out. And now I'm going to have a great life. And he said, you're going to go to fucking jail. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, because this isn't a business to you. This is a game. And he said, you can't stop. And he said, you're going to get caught. He said, this is a business, and I got what I want, and I'm leaving. So what happened to that guy? Did he, he lived. Did he ever get caught? Did no. Ever, like, no one knows who he is to this day? And he No, did he's gone. Well, he's dead now. Oh, well, that happens. Time uh, caught sure. up with him. Yeah. But he married a... He divorced his wife <laughs> mm -hmm. <coughs> and married a Colombian girl and moved there. Somewhere. Yeah. And lived happily ever after in luxury. I don't know. Like, yeah. I mean. How many other pilots that worked for you did the same thing? Most of them. Yeah. They're all pretty smart boys. Mm -hmm. Calculated. All right. Yeah. And like. You can't stay on the other side of the fence all the time. You'll lose. I know. But you some, have to be right 100% of the time. You're but, right 99% of the time. You're going to go to jail. But who the hell wants to stay on the other side of the fence, all right? Yeah, I do. Uh, I come like clearly. I'm on the George, side, the right side. You're an you know, addict. You're a thrill junkie, too. You <laughs> love the game. Yeah, it was. You're, yeah, smart. I, you're well, smart. I understand. I understand. Thank you. I, under, I understood the game, and, I, and at times it, it was just a, a game, outwitting everybody and, and moving the pieces it's around the board. a cocky, egotistical son of a bitch. It is. Game, every every time, because I ask you, like, when I would fly and I would be done with my runs, 
fuck, it was the, it was the, the chemical bouillabaisse beige in my brain was just the best drug in the world. Oh, geez. You know what? It wasn't like while I was doing it. But after I was done landing and I put the machine away, it was like, and I'm driving home, it's like, wow. Very few people I've ever done shows with. Yep. Okay, and I've done a lot of them forever. Yeah. Know what I know and you do. And I salute you, you son of a bitch. Oh, <laughs> and I think, yeah. I think I found a new friend. No, yeah, maybe. And God Anything's knows, possible. God what knows you? what we'll conjure up someday. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm staying on the right side of the law. Yeah. I'd cross my teeth, dot my eyes. Yeah, but don't do have to george i think it's a little different with mike the, i don't think he was as addicted to the thrill he was trying more to make money and be successful but i don't think he was as addicted you to, to our, the you thrill want, you want right. to replace the thrill with saying that our products were for cannabis when no one else would right because it was it was it was a chess game i had to play to uh be able to do that he was addicted to the thrill you don't know yeah. it's like Trying to tell somebody about, you know, skydiving or, you know, without a parachute. And, well, like, I, and I like think it's um, impossible for you to understand. But he understands and I understand. I think and, I understand to a degree. Like for, you know, I went around and fixed businesses most of my life. And the more fucked up the businesses were and the quicker I could fix them, it was, nobody understood what I could do or the alchemy or how I, you know, I could go into a business that's losing money and fix it. And it was all me He's really good at this. And it was all me. And it's the same sort of thrill that it's you against some crazy obstacle that nobody understands. And everybody tells you, you can't do it. And everybody's lying to you and it's a big game, but, um, I could, I could mess up. We couldn't, it was death or jail. Yeah. So I could, you know, in my early stages, yeah, but you didn't risk your I, life. I ran a couple into the ground instead of fixing them. Well, you were a goddamn criminal. Hey, you belong. No, in but I, w I wasn't. Um, you you can achieve the same sort of it's thing. Not, it's very to addictive to do that. But but you gamble your life. You know, it's like playing. What he and I did, we played Russian roulette. Right. Okay. Yeah. What's the biggest load you ever lost? I don't know. Two tons. A blow or weed. Blow. Oh my God. What's the, what was that worth? They dropped it. I told them, okay, listen to me. Yeah. They dropped it in the Everglades. Yeah. And I told them the plane didn't have the fuel range. Yeah. Okay. But they did it anyway. Wow. And then they dropped it in the Everglades. And then they wanted me to go look for it, you know, and helicopters and all this shit and everything. Oh. And like, I mean, they were they were in highly insane moments, okay? Well, and one time this fat Colombian, he was weighed three hundred and fifty pounds. He wanted to ride in the plane. El Gordo. Yeah. The the old El Gordo. The heffy, the stupid okay. He wanted to ride in the plane and I tried to explain to him how much he yeah. him not riding in the plane yeah. was worth. Yep. And didn't matter. No. Yeah. Nothing mattered. It's like and they tell you the landing strip's so long. Yeah. And it's not that long. Yeah. And you walk it, and it's like fucking 500 feet short. Oh. And they don't care. Right? Okay, take off anyway. You know, yeah. good. You could clear the trees. You can get killed. And then you get killed, and they just plow the goddamn plane into the jungle, and nobody cares. Next. And we, yeah. Oh, wow. And did you ever lose any pilots? Two. Yeah. Yeah. And, one of them I loved with well, my heart and soul and my Dave. And in fact, he was gonna help me escape from federal prison. Really? Yeah. And that's how I, and he was, after his smuggling was over and I went to jail and he was the only one with the balls and he'd been in Nam and he'd been everywhere. And he, had, he was an ace, okay? Mm -hmm. and. Yeah. He was a wonderful son of a bitch, and he loved the game, too. He didn't care about the money. Yeah. In fact, he retired, and I went to his house in Palm Beach, and his wife said, go talk to him. He's out by the pool. And I said, he's crazy. And I said, what's wrong, Dave? And he said, he said, I, I want back in. Oh, I man. can't stand this any longer. Sitting here, I buy it to sit here one more time. I'm going nuts. And... 
So I let him back in. Yep. I mean, not that I was in control or whatever, but, and then he went, retired again and he started ferrying aircraft for out of cams and stuff okay mm-hmm. for the dealerships oh, from cessna yeah after mm-hmm. all the shit that he Wichita. did yeah mm-hmm. he's he pretty smart old boy aren't you yeah a few things that's why i'm working for you on this goddamn uh, well, show we're, we're, chris and i appreciate that and there was water in the fuel line yep and he died in a goddamn cornfield after Nam and smuggling and <laughs> you know you know if you if you if you fly it's just a matter of time before you lose a friend in the flying in the aviation world you know but i you know flying was okay to me and whatever mm-hmm. i was I, I always had a goddamn problem with landing mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. i was a shitty shitty pilot all right but you're still here alive, so I wouldn't say you're shit. No, that's pilot. because of the gods of chaos. Yeah. They want me around because yeah. I'm such a fuck up, right? Oh. Yeah, I'm their entertainment. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> you know. So if you have if you're 24 years old, what would you tell yourself about this whole thing? Would you be a better drug dealer or would you be a better businessman or a combination of both? I think I would have married a rich woman. <laughs> You've been a gigolo. Yeah, I played polo. You got the skills? <laughs> yeah, I did one time. Oh, very good. Okay. Hey, that's what matters. Very cool. I would not have bet he was going to answer it that way. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's a good answer. It is. You'd that's like funny. to do that too, wouldn't you? <laughs> no. No. Okay, don't lie to me. God damn so, it. Do we have any questions in the audience? What do you think? This is a young man right there. We got, we got one right here. You know who that young man is? Yes. Yeah, okay. He's the son of Rick Ross. A man I admire a lot yeah. and think think the world of. Yeah. And I didn't even know Ricky had a son. And he's really? A good kid right he, there. Was he moving a lot of your product? I or the time had more, moved, right? more or less met my demise before okay. Ricky came on board. And, like, you know, a lot of people don't know the whole story, and yeah. they should. Yeah. And I, I think the world of his dad. It was a, it was a good interview. Yeah. A good show. Yeah. But George, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, trafficking drugs, there's like skills that you had that are similar to skills that business people have. So like what, would, what skills would you say you used in trafficking that you can use in business? Very good question. Okay, that's pretty complicated, goddamn. I wish I didn't meet you. <laughs> <laughs> well, one is math. Uh, yeah, you know your okay. Yeah. Okay, skills and and logistics and money and and you know, I was in the transport business. Well, I was uh, thinking like distribution, marketing, sales, well, those I didn't, type of things, you know. I did I had the best marketing in the world because Product. The Hollywood, yeah, product. Okay, exactly. in the record industry, they marketed my product, and you know, I I promote, I sold to the high end, to the wealthy, okay, the rich and famous or whatever, and I I mean, people in the street didn't have cocaine then, and you know, and the whole thing, the how the crack cocaine became on the street is because of the goddamn government, all right? And it was an evil fucking force. And I don't mind saying it. And you wanna put me back in jail for saying it? I don't give a shit, all right? Because it's true, all right? And I spent 20 years in prison and I watched the federal prisons fill up with young black kids, okay? Mm -hmm. Who had a handful of crack cocaine Five little rocks doing 25 years, and they would come to my cell and cry. And why you got five times the amount of time in prison for a handful of crack cocaine, and the guy who had the white kid who had the powder got three to five years. All right? And listen to me. You know, it's evil and it's wrong. And, and people will say, 
Who, what right do I have to speak out? You know what? I have the right to speak out because I lived it and I've been there and I've done it. And I've seen it. Okay. And I'm not here to bullshit anybody. I'm not here. I'm telling the truth. And there are, you know what? There are people today, 80% of the people in prison for marijuana are there because of possession. That's true. All right. And all these shows that I go to, High Times and this and that or mm -hmm. whatever and everything, there's people there, thousands and thousands of people all smoked out of their minds, okay? And like, and money all over the place and everything. And does anybody there care about those kids that are locked up like animals and their lives ruined? Does anybody, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, what the hell has happened? Our company does. Yeah, of course we do. It's well, like it's like we I'd like out. to help your company to make it happen if I can, mm -hmm. if you'll allow me. Let's see what the plan looks like. I'm open to it. I don't have a plan, but you know what? I want people. The girl on our the show, Next Marijuana Millionaire, Brooke, she uh, she very actively pursues you know the, the whole prisoner issue. She does a great job with it too, by the way. Well, I would like it. These people. They want to smoke all the time and make all this goddamn money and the growing and everything like to help these kids get out of prison. Right, well, to stand up here, the, if you have a cannabis charge in the state of California, they're they're going to give you amnesty. They're going to expunge it off your record. That's just California. Yeah, true, but it's a start. I know it's it's a, it's a huge start. There's 40 million people in the state. They need to get these kids out of there. Yeah, I they agree. Need to make people wake up stand up to it yeah. i mean I, I i believe that will happen more and more and more well as time if, goes on because people look at it if you, well, you know what the problem is the the, the, the jails here are, are a business i know it's a, listen it sucks the whole drug concept is about business it employs judges lawyers doctors indian chiefs prison guards okay facilitators this that and like it's a huge multi-billion dollar, dollar machine. industry yeah, okay it and it's insane it's insane and you're talking about 40 years of war on drugs for christ's sake what war has ever gone on for 40 years and it's a total failure i mean i mean that's that's insane it i is. mean it is jesus christ i mean and nobody cares there's people nobody, getting nobody, rich on both sides. There's people who care. There are people who care. There's, there's not enough of them. Though. And Joe Apio, like in Arizona, oh, him. Trump pardons him. You got to be bullshitting me. I mean, what's going on here? What do you think is going on? I know what's going on. They came here and they killed all the goddamn Indians, and then they put in God we trust on the money. That's what's going on. No. Yeah. Took the land. Okay. You have a point. Now, if you That's want to know enough. the goddamn truth, go to an Indian reservation someday. Yeah. Okay. That's what we bequeath to them. Yeah. 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 From Beverly Hills to out in the Arizona desert, and poverty and drugs and fucking desolation and deprivation. They own the goddamn place. They were here first. They were. Yeah, that's the gift we gave them. Any other questions? George, do you think approaching a business like it's a game that you want to win, which is a story I heard from you during well, while you were talking, do you think that's the best way to approach a business? The best way to approach any business is to look at the profits and the loss concept, okay? And, and the penalties for losing, all right? And... What I did was illegal, and I always equated, you know, the majority of people that that sell drugs that do drugs, okay, don't know the penalty. They don't know the penalty. And I had enough money where I had lawyers that told me the penalty, and I knew oh, yeah. the risk. But you know, when, when Billy gives his friend Bobby the keys to a van and tells him to drive it to Michigan, Okay, mm -hmm. you know, give him five thousand dollars. He doesn't know what the penalty is. Interstate transportation, the RICO Act, mm -hmm. or this and that, and they take the kid and they give him 15 years. 
because he took five thousand. And you have to know the risk and the lot and the profit and loss and what it's worth to to go out there and do it. And it's the same in business, legal business. All right. So wrapping up. Do do you feel like we got an answer from him about what he would tell his twenty four year old self? Not really. No. no, he's got great stories, but he didn't really answer. Yeah, but that's so some like if so. you could go back in time and you're sitting there with yourself at twenty four, sure. and you're you know only you would tell yourself the truth. What would you say to yourself if you were sitting there and you had fifteen minutes to talk to yourself when you were twenty four? What would you that's say? That's serious. That's serious. Everything you know. That's a, would you tell him to get back in the blow business? Would you tell him no? Don't do this. Do that. Do that's this. That's a like hypothetical. What? Of course yeah, it is. I mean, for Christ's that's sake. what makes like, it that's fun. That's what makes it. That's that's Ooh, it. at twenty four. Right. You, you have an you? opportunity. All to, you want. You is, have an opportunity to talk to yourself and set the record straight right, right now, so you don't have to go through the pain that you went through. What are you going to tell yourself? If if, if if anything, I lived it. I did it, and I'm glad I goddamn did it. And that's it. Would you look at yourself and tell you, yeah, George? We have this segment we do at the end of the show. Time. A 24 year old kid wants a cold beer and a piece of ass. All right. Bro, all right. Yes, that's true. But what all about right. what the advice are you gonna give this kid? George, you're, you're, you're 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 in front of this like yourself. What are you gonna say? I got a lot to say to myself, man. I could. You know what? I can't. Speak to that kid for 15 minutes or two, five minutes. <laughs> all right. I need a couple of years with that kid. Oh, fine. All right. Okay. And then, <laughs> and then you know what? And what, would, what would be you the, know, the you net, know what? net of it all? Like, I remember my father, we went down to Cape Cod, a favorite beach and this and that. Oh. And he said, God damn, they paved this over and like, you know, mm -hmm. they ruined part of the beach or whatever. You know, I'm sitting there, I'm standing there next door. I love the man, a hot and so on. I'm listening to him. But I want to go see Mary Sue, okay, and get a piece of ass and have a beer. Okay. And I don't care if they paved the beach over, all right? <laughs> all right. But now that I'm old, I got time to think about how they paved it over and the bastards, okay? Okay, but I'm going to change the question. It's your first day in the job when you're smuggling weed, and now you meet yourself. What are you going to say to yourself? Wow. <laughs> that's it. All right. That didn't work, no Mike? advice. No advice. Like, hey, avoid these crazy fucking Listen, Colombians. But I put a middleman in between. There weren't no Colombians, of okay? There weren't, and yeah. and I couldn't even speak Spanish, and I didn't know shit from Shinola. The only one time I've ever been to Mexico was Tijuana at the bullfights on a bus. Yeah. The, the bar hired in Manhattan Beach. Okay, everybody went down there, and I went down there. You know why I went to Mexico to smuggle weed? Why? Because I loved Richard Burton and Liz Taylor in the movie, okay, yeah. and Night of the Iguana. Okay. And it was filmed in Puerto Vallarta. Oh, okay. And, that, and my friends from UMass and whatever, they said, well, where should we go? And I said, God damn it, man, we'll go to Puerto Vallarta. I know about that place. Oh. And really, that's how it happened. And we were there like two weeks, two weeks, okay? Yeah. We couldn't speak Spanish. And we couldn't even find a joint. And all of a sudden, my best boyhood buddies, yeah. we were sitting at the bar and they started to look at me with that look like, you asshole, George, all right? We're out of here, man. We're going back to the other way, get stuff in LA and drive it, okay? And I, my ego was smashed. And I had a hell of an ego then. Mm -hmm. Because I was young, handsome, and I thought I was a son of a bitch, okay? Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, the gods of chaos, I call them. A little blonde got off a Volkswagen at the bar. Oh, it was a yellow Volkswagen with flowers painted on it. Mm -hmm. and, like, and she was as cute as the Volkswagen. And she walked up and she sat down at the table. This is the God's honest truth. And she said, hi, I'm Linda. And I said, what about it? And she said, you guys have been here two weeks and you've asked everybody but the police chief for pot. And she said, I'm here to save you. Wow. She said, I live with the biggest pot connection, okay? And I'm gonna take you there. And I said, Linda, God bless you a little hard. Yeah. So what would you say? Take the ride with Linda when she meets you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. You're stretching, Mike. You're stretching. I got to go for something. 
Thanks, you, George. Yeah, George. You're you a great want, guest. You got you great want, stories. You want something else, man. I wish I could give it to you. That's no, okay. you have. There was a lot of lessons here. That's there was okay. a lot of lessons in this show. Tons, actually. Yeah. Just uh, for like kids out there or whatever. Just grow up and be true to yourself and and know the existence of your soul. And because that's your monitor for right and wrong. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. And follow as truly as you can that that monitor because that's there's no explanation for it. There's no explanation for God. There's no and like that's your your device to make you do right and do and know what's wrong and like you know and nothing is perfect. And nor should it ever be. And that's the way it was designed. And if you want to know any more, I, I'm 67 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. 77 years old. I 77. Think. Okay. Uh, I like going back. back. 77 and, whatever. And pretty soon when when Destiny calls me, mm -hmm. and I, I'll have a talk with the guy up there. I'll demand to talk to him, and I'll send you all back a postcard, all right? <laughs> send us back a, a, a report, what the hell yeah, it's all about. All right. all right. And what it's really all about. My favorite thing you said is life is a gamble, but luck is an art form. Right. I like that. That is. It's great. Luck is an art form. It is. Thank you, George. Great. Thank great you, George. Job. You know what? <laughs> Thank right. you. You guys are great. Thank you. And it's been wonderful.